Good morning, I'm Pastor Larson, Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida, inviting you to join us in this Bible study, which we are hosting on Zoom, and now you are invited in to study with us. I'm going to share the screen if it is not working uh, and, and, and make it work. So let's get started. Are you all ready? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. I, I think that uh, we have a, we have a quorum. We have a, we have a quorum and uh, that, that should work. Right. Well, it should work. I have trouble with this at times and I know what it is. I need to go over there and there we go. Okay. Now, do you see what we are sharing? The Lord loves to hear us pray. And you were promised a new topic today, but I didn't tell anybody what it, would going, what it was going to be. The Lord loves to hear us pray. Is that, is that true? Yes. Yes. Everybody has an amen to that? Amen. The Lord loves amen. to hear us pray. Well, let's take advantage of that, shall we? That's my, my invitation to you. My invitation comes from uh, the Lord. All right. And think about all the things that that means. The Lord loves to hear us pray. Where is God when you need him? I think that that has been uttered by every soul who believes there is a God and who wonders, where is God when you need him? Well, I'm going to say to you what I know from Scripture. He is close enough to hear you pray. He's right here. You hear the word here in both senses of the homophone. Well, so what moves you to pray? And why do we pray? And does God command us to pray? We're going to look at that this morning. What do we pray for? Well, <laughs> that's everything. How can we know how to pray? I think some of you struggle with that from time to time. Are there any rules for prayer? <laughs> and who gets to make them anyway? What about prayers that God doesn't seem to answer? Maybe in some future time together, we'll look at that, um, the so-called unanswered prayer. And I say so-called because every prayer is answered. Where is God when you need him? I'm going to repeat, he is close enough to hear you pray. God is always present. He is with you. You believe that, don't you? God is with you. All right? And do that from time to time. How does the Lord invite us to pray? Oh, there are loads and loads of Bible passages that have the invitation. We're going to talk about that this morning. Can we hear the promises God has made to hear our prayers? Yes. We'll look at some of them. I don't think we'll ever look at all of them. What kinds of things stand in the way of our prayers? I'm just asking questions. We're not answering any of them yet. What kinds of things keep us from praying? And when we pray, what kinds of things keep the Lord from answering according to our will, what we want? Well, over the period of human history, God's people have always prayed. Well, here are a few of them. <laughs> I could not list them all, but if you study the word pray or ask the Lord or speak, spoke to God, if you look at those phrases in a computer, look up, you can find many, many people who have prayed from Adam to Habakkuk in the Old Testament. Some of the others prayed, it just didn't say that in the Bible. Okay. It's hard to imagine a believer that didn't pray once or many times. Can you think of any other Old Testament person 
who prayed that's not in this list? Anybody? Well, Rebecca, not Rebecca. Well, Rebecca, yes. Esther is who I was thinking. Esther is a unique book of the Bible in which the name of God is not mentioned. Oh, okay. But uh, she certainly had a lot of help from God. And then in the New Testament, uh, Jesus prayed. So did Paul and Peter and John and James. The apostles were gathered together with the rest of the 120 in the upper room in Acts chapter 1, and these all prayed, and they were heard. Uh, sometimes they had something deep and important on their mind concerning the church, and they prayed for help in deciding what to do. This morning I was reading in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts, and they gathered together to decide what to do. They needed the Lord's help. Well, why? Why have God's people prayed to him? Can you think of any, any of the very obvious reasons? Anyone? For help. For help when they're in trouble. Right. Or when they're ill. Anybody else? I'll well, say I'll... thank you for what we did get. <clears throat> I, I didn't hear I didn't hear Christine's answer. I said to thank him also for the good things we had. That's yeah. a big that's a big thing, yeah. Thank him. Well, they were taught by command to, to pray to him. Yes. Well, we're going to look at some of those reasons. Why have God's people prayed to him? Well, that's how it happens that way. Their prayers were all based on a relationship. Underline the word relationship. And it's a relationship that they did not create. God had established the relationship with them. I am your God. I am the Lord your God. In the New Testament, more often referred to as Father. We, we should talk about that sometime. What proper noun should I use when I pray to God? Or does it matter? Or do I have to mention his name? But their prayers, just like our prayers, are based on the relationship that we have with God. And he established it. He called that relationship into being. So these people knew God to some extent, some more than others, and they trusted him. That's faith. And they had many reasons to praise him. That's a, an attempt at summarizing the reasons that people prayed to God. They had faith to depend on him for all their needs. All. Sometimes they worried. You know how I know that the people in the Bible worried? Because the Lord and some of his apostles addressed that worry need and said, don't worry. Jesus would have never had to say, don't worry, if we didn't worry. Does he know us? Yes. You remember that two-line poem that I said to you many, many years ago? You remember it. I'll repeat it. Fear knocked at the door. Faith answered. There was no one there. And these people of the Bible brought their needs to him who answers prayer. They did that because they knew that he would answer according to his will. And they knew, some of them, some of them more than others, that he knew their needs more than they did. Isn't that true when we're growing up? Our parents knew our needs from the moment, in fact, 
for the nine months before we were born. And more and more today, they know that. And when we came into the world and took our breath, they and those around them knew our needs. We did not. And when we got a little older, we thought we knew what our needs were, but they were labeled as wants. <laughs> We bring our needs to God because we know he answers prayer. Americans pray. Would you guess what percentage of Americans pray? 20. You say 20. I, I say 30. One says 30. I was going to say 15%. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have you, think, too, don't we? <laughs> you think more are praying now? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> I'm not going to ask why. Americans pray. <laughs> what percentage pray? How many? Uh, what percentage of, of Christians pray? <laughs> well, you'd hope, hope you'd hope 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not so. Let's look at it. Uh, the Pew Research Foundation. Oh, we have the clicker problem again. Surveys uh, taken by Barna and the Pew Research Center, uh, they love to ask questions. They ask hundreds of people, and then they use their calculators and they tell us how often people pray, how often people pray. In one such survey, 55% of Americans say they pray every day. Do you believe that? Mm, no. I hear a doubt or two. Yep. It would be nice. 21% pray at least weekly or monthly. All right. Maybe that's when they go to church. That's the weekly or monthly as people go to church less often these days. And sadly, 23% say they seldom or never pray. I could make some social comments, but I'm not going there this morning. Okay. But I think you know what's wrong in America. You know many things are wrong, and there's so many more <coughs> reasons to pray. Bless you. Thank you. Does age make a difference of how often people pray? Yes. Yes. You're right. 65% of Americans over 65 say they pray da daily. <laughs> now, why would you suppose that older people pray more often? Because they learned, they learned it early. More conscientious. Our days are more counted, probably. We look at it from that point of view. Mm -hmm. Their days are numbered. <laughs> yeah, our days are numbered. At least we think they are. Teach us, Lord, yeah. to number our days. Did Linda, did you say something? I said they are numbered. We just don't know what the number is. No. So. They are numbered from the day we are conceived. Right. And I'm sure glad that God doesn't tell us our number. Amen to that. You have 23,580 days. Start counting. I don't think I'd like to live like that. No. And God doesn't want us to live like that. I live daily. How about you? Yes, yes, we do. I live moment by moment. How about you? Amen to that. I yeah. do. Yeah. I do. And I love certain moments better than others. <laughs> yes, of course. Amen. <laughs> All right. Now, why does this do that? Why does that do that to me? Do Americans rely on prayer? Well, yes, they do. Uh, they do when making major life decisions. Should we buy that house or that car or marry that woman or marry that man? What other major life decisions are there? <clears throat> I think, well, I think of conception. Yes. You know, what? How so? How so? Whether, you know, they're ready to be parent or 
ready to conceive, or if they have conceived, now what? So, I, I, you have some that grandchildren. That's a major. That's a major life decision. You have some grandchildren in that uh, area, I'm sure. Yeah, and great grandchildren coming. So, hey, <laughs> congratulations. Yes, they rely. Forty-five percent of Americans pray for help in making major decisions, and among Christians, it's fifty-five percent. I'm sad that it's that low among believers. Yeah. I, how do you make a major decision? That, uh, I don't want to share. I know how I do it, but how do you make a major decision? I think one needs to pray about it first. Um, and then, um, you know, ask for wisdom to look at uh, to look at the decision. I always think of a, a job as, as something that's always a big decision that one makes. And you look at the pros and the cons, I guess, and um, you may even ask other, other um, certainly it's helpful to ask other Christians um, also to look at it objectively, because sometimes they may see something, uh, they know us better, know, know me better than I know myself sometimes, and can give some input. Yeah, we need to seek wise counsel, godly counsel. Where? From whom? From fellow Christians that you Christians. trust. Do you do research? We have to be careful where we do our research also. That's another, you know, we pray for that discernment um, to look into the, when we look into research that we're looking in the right places. Mm-hmm. Jeannie would tell you how many hours I spend looking at reviews <laughs> of something I'm about to buy on um, the internet. I, I want to know what has gone wrong with the thing before I have to deal with that thing that comes uh, by UPS or Federal Express and but I'm not sure that all those reviews are true. There is evidence that some of them are faked. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to go on about that, but it is a problem. What about your personal examples and uh, stories that you've had about, if you're willing to share, making a major decision? May I add something here? Certainly. I, I have a, a huge failing of being an impulse person, like impulse buying, impulse decision making, and I'm working to get away from that. So, you know, that's just something else I wanted to add. Uh, I think when I uh, decided to um make a major move. Uh, one of the things after John passed away, which is over two years ago, I know I knew one thing to do is they say, don't make any major decisions of one year after you lose a spouse or something major like that happens. And that was a good idea from there. Um, but when I started looking um, as to alternative, alt excuse me here alternative places to uh, go to live. Um, I had a, a girlfriend, a Christian girlfriend, and uh, she led me into uh, the facility that I'm now living at. Um, and I did do some research on it, which I uh, found out it was a Christian organization and it, um, uh, it had a good financial record and started looking at it. And so um, it, uh, it helped me to make to make decisions along with uh, along with a lot of prayer. Um, I know talking to my friends, uh, I got I got good input and I got input that I didn't want to you know hear. Uh, most of it was more on a personal basis, like you know I don't want you to move or leave or whatever or, or move away too far and those types of things. Uh, and I didn't want to do that either, but. Um, 
that all, you know, that all helped to make the decision where I'm living now here in a retirement community, so, uh, which I'm not sorry for. But it took, you know, it took almost, uh, it took eight or nine months. It also required, you know, to look at financial things uh, to make sure, you know, everything was in order. So it was a big decision for me to have to make all by myself and not have uh, another person uh, other than my son to really call on. But, uh, I thank you for sharing that. Many people prayed for you while you were making that decision. Yes, yes. Thank you all again very much. Anybody else like to share? Well, when I had, uh, I was in a car accident in 2014. And so I had tried many different things for the pain in my back over the next two years and uh, finally ended up in 2016 deciding to have surgery but it was a very long process to get to the point of okay because you know it's very scary to have your back worked on because you don't know what the outcome is going to be you have hopes for what it will be but you don't know so i i had many prayers for um just guidance and which way to go with that and, and whether that was a good thing for me or not. Turns out it was it, very good and much, much better than it was before. But there was a, a lot of prayer went into that and a lot of people's support and help. Thank you, Jamie. Anyone else? It's a time for sharing. Well, we had the same thing when uh, 2004. Yeah. What to, what to do next as far as retirement. And it was amazing how God opened doors and made it quite apparent that we were indeed to move to Erie, Pennsylvania. And, um, and I really think it was the power of prayer of Christian friends and ourselves and family that uh, guided us that we, this is where we were meant to be. So... It just, he, doors just keep opening. So it was, you know, it was meant to be. You felt comfortable with the decision because you knew God was behind it. And so close to your brother and sister. Well, that, I mean, that was definitely, yes. And mom and dad were still alive at the time and they spent winter summers here. So, but yes, but I mean, it just, I, there was no openings at the hospital. But the head of the maternal child department said, we'll make a place for you. <clears throat> a house in the same neighborhood my sister and brother lived in became available. It was just all kinds of things that it was felt like a God thing for sure. That this is what was supposed to happen. So here we are. Interject on that God thing because, you know, I said on impulse. Well, the, I mean, I do pray now and I try to slow down and have and pray for discernment most, mostly, um, but uh, other than praise. But I look back on my life and I've had many major upheavals. Let me put it that way. I, that's the only way I, there's different things. And I look back on it and I think God was there every single turn to where I ended up here. I mean, because I, there's no way that he wasn't there protecting me during all that time. And so if anything, I'm, I'm thankful for uh, that. And it gives me more reason to want to pray now for more decision-making, major decision-making as we're getting near the end. Maybe I'm just maturing. Well, we need to do that along the way, so. <laughs> Yes, sometimes at different rates. <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, I do thank you for all uh, your sharing and the others. Um, I have to share too. Um, I just want to thank you for your stories. And I feel like I'm always amazed when I look back, when I do journal about some of my prayers for myself and others. And when I see the, um, wow, you know, the results of those prayers, they aren't always what I had hoped but I feel like I too can look back and see, oh, God's hand was in this and his intention is better than maybe what I had hoped for or um, 
you know, I see those resolutions. And I think that's always surprising to me because sometimes you don't always trace things back or, you know, because you get so busy moving forward in life. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's amazing. And I kind of agree with you, Christine, that you can see that God was there with you or with whoever you're praying for. And, and I pray that more often now is just that God will be with me because I can't change the way things are happening and um, what happens in our lives. But if we can just have peace and the comfort and the knowledge that he's with us, we know that we'll continue to, to do his will. We hope so. Very well said. Karen, that's a great, great witness. And that's, uh, that's something that we can do when we pray as we ought, I'll use the word ought, but not a lot, because prayer is a privilege. I hate, hate to say, well, I'm not going to get into that subject, but when we witness, as you have done, several of you, we tell other people that we have a God who listens to prayer and who answers prayer. They may be doubting God, but your witness tells them, wait a minute, there's something real here. There is something worth looking into. So let's look into that. I thank you for your stories. Why should we pray? Well, uh, what reasons can you give? Just shout them out. To praise God for his goodness. Praise, all right. If I had a whiteboard, I'd be scribbling this up there now. You do it in your minds. What other reasons? Why should we pray? Guidance. Guidance. Well, along with that, I think goes discernment. All right, discernment. Frank added Thanksgiving. I think of um, deliverance. Deliverance. Yeah. That's a big Bible word. I yeah. know it is. Uh, we should pray because we have faith and trust in the Lord that will listen and he will answer our prayers. Maybe not the way we want them, but he will answer our prayers. I think, I think we pray for relief from worry and, and things. We pray to be relieved of, of, of worldly things or, or bad things or whatever. We pray for relief. Mm -hmm. Relief. For help? Think, for help. That would be help, yes. yes. For advice. Let me get more specific. Um, Martin Luther, in the large catechism, uh, says that I'm going to list four reasons for us to pray. And one is his command to pray. We're going to deal with that. The command. Come sit here. The command to pray. And because of God's promise to hear. And because, and this is beautiful, the way Luther ties his large catechism to the small catechism, is he gives us the words to pray. What are those words? They begin, Our Father. I was going to say the Lord's Prayer. Yes. And because of our need and our neighbor's great need. Uh, people who don't speak of it that way say that uh, the four reasons to pray start with praise. And then command and promise and that he gives us the words to pray or because of the great need that we have. There's no official list anywhere that I know of, but there are a lot of reasons to pray. And this is an attempt to sum them up in four or five or six ideas. The reasons to pray include this command to pray. And if you had catechism as a child, you learned this by heart. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will glorify me. Three steps. You pray, I will answer with that word that you mentioned, uh, deliverance. And at the end of that, 
and you've just done that in your witness, you glorify God because if you pray and God answers, it is not you that answer. It is not you that solve the problem or get the, make the deliverance hap happen for yourself. You are glorifying God because you can say, I prayed to the Lord. No credit to me. I did what he asked. I put my worries on him. And he answered. And if you didn't memorize that as a 13-year-old, you'd put it in your memory book today. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will glorify me. You can look up Psalm 50, verse 15 later on. That's my prescription for you today. Do you pray because you have been commanded to pray? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a funny question, isn't it? It's kind of one of my trick questions. I would say if that's what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do. So, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think it's, it is part of our training uh, as a Christian. Uh, training. Yeah, I was going to say, I guess training is the word I'm going to use as a Christian. Who trained you? Confirmation class. <laughs> oh, my, my, par my parents, um, initially, they trained me uh, by bringing me to the Lord at baptism. Did they train you by teaching you, now I lay me down to sleep? And they taught me by that and by... Uh, prayers and uh, a meal prayer, you know, come Lord Jesus prayer, which I think we all know in some of those uh, songs, Sunday school teachers taught me, uh, pastors taught me in confirmation class, uh, although I didn't listen very well there, I have to say, um, and then Bible classes and pastors and, and uh, other Christians as I've grown up in my adult life. A lot of training. And let me say it this way. God isn't through with us yet. <laughs> no. He is still training us. And sometimes he trains us with a bit of chastisement. And we'll get to that in a, in a week or two. There's a lot to go through. This is a rich, rich load, L-O-D-E. We're mining, we're mining the scriptures to see what God has said about prayer. And we won't cover it all. No, not in this lifetime will we properly learn to pray. And I'll look at the imperative verbs. This is a new subject with me and you. The imperative verbs in the Bible verses that have that command, and yet there's another wrinkle to them. The command to pray is what I am calling, what we might call, an invitation imperative. And it's like this. <laughs> when, uh, when the cook calls uh, that dinner is ready, they issue an invitation. But the word come is a command, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You better come or you're not going to get anything to eat or it's going to be cold. And out of courtesy and love or just because we don't want to be <laughs> a grump, we come when dinner is ready. Now, those of you who live alone, <laughs> but you remember how it was when you lived in a family, someone called and said dinner is ready and you came. There's an invitation and it's wrapped around the imperative. It makes the imperative sound nice. Now I want to discuss invitations with you. Now, for example, the Lord's Supper. Jesus says in the 26th chapter of Matthew and the 14th chapter of Mark and in the 22nd chapter of Luke, he says, take and eat, take and drink. This do ye. And those are commands, aren't they? There's a command because there is the word in the imperative voice. It doesn't matter whether you do it in the Greek or in English. It's do this. But the Lord's Supper is gospel, not law. And 
it is law that has the imperative for a voice. And yet the Lord's Supper is not optional. But then who would refuse Jesus' invitation? That is a ripe question for pastors to discuss. And I would wish that sometime we have a pastor's conference that would look at that invitation that is refused by 40 to 60 percent of our membership. Mm -hmm. It is a sad, sad thing that so many refuse. But I'm not going to discuss that with you today. Jesus issues a command. <laughs> it's such a soft command, but it makes my point. Come to me, all ye who are heavy laden. That isn't the full verse. Uh, and I will give you rest. It's another invitation imperative with a promise. It's like, come to dinner. Everything is ready. There's a promise in there. You're going to come. You're going to get something good to eat. I know that. You know, three times a day, I, I, I get that invitation. Come to me, all who are heavy laden. Jesus issues an invitation which is wrapped around the imperative. You see the picture? Mm -hmm. Yep. It's got your name on it. If you are heavy laden with cares, you come to him. And he takes, he takes your burden and he gives you his. My burden is light. All right. Look at the following imperative verbs in the, uh, look at the imperative verbs in the following Bible verses. Boy, time is rushing on. More invitation imperatives. Would someone rest my voice and read this from, I don't have the reference. Hmm. More invitation imperatives. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there are two imperatives, repent and be baptized. Those are commands. But there's an invitation that's wrapped around them. And in Acts 2.38, Acts 2.38, there's the promise. Forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Who would not come when we are told to come and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, the invitation was out there so that people would know that Jesus wants them with him, and it was issued through the Apostle Peter in that great sermon at Pentecost. And 3,000 were added to the church that day. Up until that point, there were only 120. That's multiplication. So we go on, if we can get the clicker to work. I don't know why it stops. These invitations and the imperatives uh, offer us or lead us to freely use the gifts of grace the Lord offers. What believer would not come when the Lord calls? What do you think of these examples? Good. Invitation imperatives. What I think of them is I can't understand why there's so there's so many hard stones out there. I think I mentioned that before. Yeah. That don't that don't um, see at all. There's that why question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think like, like many things that we that are good for us, we might need that in, invitation or that, that beginning to start this or even as you said, um, like a requirement. But I find that in my prayer life as an adult, I've, 
I see it more as a communication and a communion with God. And it's, it's a blessing to me. It's a, it becomes something I want to do. And perhaps as a new Christian or a young person um, or someone who's turned away, we need that reminder that it is required that we must come to God and, and pray. But I think like all things that are good for us, we see the benefit and we start to um, we just want to do it because we reap the benefits of it. So. I appreciate your sharing, Karen. I don't think I, I thought of it as an invitation before. Um, it was more of a command, but when you, the way you're explaining it, 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 it's, um, it is an invitation and a command, but I didn't think I ever thought of it as an invitation before. All right. I think even as believers, um, if we're kind of, um, lax in our, um, practice of our faith and we start relying on ourselves too much that even when the Lord calls we don't want to give up some of that uh, control that we've acquired or esteem or pride or whatever it is um, that's um, giving us the feel-good feeling and and uh, you know, I guess accept the ex go back and accept the gift uh, really of, of from whom all these blessings come from. Accept the gift. Okay. I, I think um, the word invitation is a very good word for people going out to try to get other people to come to the Lord. I've never, uh, you know, the people I know that are very good at that, I don't think they use the word invitation. It's a good word. I mean, in the, with the imperative and stuff and everything. It's a good word. Come to church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a good question for you to think about during the week. And I don't expect an answer today, but I have asked this, this question for several years now. And it is this. Why should an unbeliever want to come to church? I know you know your reasons, but their reasons yeah. for not coming are many, many, many. And some of them are infantile and others are serious. What I'm saying to you is that the worship service is designed in large part, and pastors know this very well and they, they agonize over it, it's designed to feed the flock and those who are not in the flock could be fed also but they don't understand the language we speak in a different language on sunday morning and we're working hard at trying to bridge that it's a books have been written many books have been written in the past couple of decades about making the invitation come in a way that meets the unbeliever where he or she is. So you, you can dwell on that this week, but I don't think that we're going to answer it. I try to close this uh, by 11. And next week, we're going to talk more about that command. And I'm going to lead us into some difficulties and then a way out of those difficulties. I have an idea that we're going to go into a psalm and the study of David and his, um, his problems with pride and all those kinds of things. I'm doing a tease, as they often do <laughs> on the TV screen and on the radio, that uh, here's something um, that I think you're going to be uh, enjoying very much, and I have enjoyed the study. Uh, it, it took me many weeks to decide what would be the next topic or Bible book. And I have 18 ideas written down on a sheet wow. of paper. <laughs> uh -huh. I have 18 other ideas that I didn't uh, pick up. And um, maybe we'll do one of those. As the Lord gives us time together, I thank you for joining us. You're all welcome here and you're welcome to let me know by email if someone else uh, would like to be invited 
and that word, <laughs> a very good term, that we would love to have them on the screen. I'll do that with you this way. And uh, the Lord bless and keep you and give you both reasons to pray this week and uh, reasons to thank him for answered prayer. Any final comments? <laughs> I just want to thank my dad and my brothers for getting me here today. I appreciated this time. And I would like if I could just ask if people could pray for my friend Joanne and her daughter who uh, tried to commit suicide through all this. She's got some health issues anyway, but the, it's just a big burden for her as a mom. And we're worried about the daughter that she can um, find more reasons for being here. So anyway, if you could keep Joanne and Corinna in your prayers, I appreciate that. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Keep Joanne in your prayers. Reasons to live. Oh, man. Uh, we could do an hour on that without studying. I love you in Christ, and I uh, ask the Lord to bless and keep you until uh, we meet again. Pastor Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. Come to us at 8.30 or 10.30 in person with proper masks and distancing. We've got it all set up for you. And if that doesn't work for you because of your health then you are welcome to watch and participate online. I don't have that slide handy because I can't do it that quickly. But it's at 8.30 and 10.30. And you go to trinitydelray.org slash live, L-I-V-E. trinitydelray.org slash live. And there at 8.30 and 10.30, the worship service is being broadcast. You're welcome to join us there and next Saturday or Sunday at 10 o'clock. Now the benediction, the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. Bye-bye mm -hmm. all. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.